Good morning and welcome to Facebook Live from CPAC 2017. I'm Rob Louie, Editor-in-Chief of The Daily Signal. We're joined by John Lott, who is with the Crime Prevention Research Center and also the author of several books on guns, including The War on Guns, Arming Yourself Against Control, Gun Control Lies. John, it's great to have you back oh, on the program. Great to see you again. Yeah, so it's been an exciting uh, CPAC so far. We've had one day in, President Trump speaks today, and then of course we'll wrap up tomorrow. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a CPAC where you have a lot of Second Amendment enthusiasts. In fact, we're located right next to NRA TV. Right. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, though, about a big decision out of the Fourth Circuit this week. Uh, that's the circuit that covers the Mid-Atlantic, including Maryland, which was the case being decided. And Maryland imposed a gun ban, as I understand, after uh, the Newtown shooting. And this was upheld by this, uh, this, this federal circuit. And I'd like you to share with our, our audience a little bit about what the ban is and why this is so consequential. Right. Well, this is the second time the circuits heard this. This was an en banc decision. All the appeals court judges voted on this. And it was a, virtually a party line vote. Democrats voted to support the ban. The Republicans voted against it. And uh, the argument was essentially that uh, these are weapons of war that they were talking about. And so that it was purely a good safety issue to go and ban weapons of war from mm. people being able to own. Uh, you know, they talk about military style a lot in the decision, but it's, you kind of wonder whether these judges know anything about guns, because the guns that we're talking about, these so-called assault weapons, are semi-automatic guns. They look like military weapons, but they're not the ones that any military would use. There are three types of guns. They're machine guns, one pull the trigger, lots of bullets come yes. out semi-automatic, one pull the trigger, one bullet comes out, it reloads itself, pull the trigger again, one more bullet comes out, and so on. And then you have manually loaded guns. Okay. The types of guns like an M16 have machine gun modes, you know, where you can have one pull the trigger and lots of bullets come out. An AR-15 looks like an M16, but it's the same inside guts as a small caliber hunting rifle that's okay. there. And so, uh, you know, you have the court using lots of kind of scary language in its decision, but you know, it's, uh, it's pretty clear that they don't understand what they're talking about. Well, two follow-up questions. Where does it go from here, this case? Will it be heard by the Supreme Court, or, or is this kind of the final decision in your opinion? And then secondly, we can come back to this, what does this speak to the importance of President Trump and the over 100 judicial vacancies that exist on the courts right now? Well, I think it speaks strongly to both issues. I mean, Democrats have about two-thirds of the federal judges in the country. And just as in this case, the votes on these issues tend to be pretty much party line. And so, uh, you know, if you had had Hillary Clinton win and you had had even a larger Democratic majority on the courts, you know, there wouldn't have been much left in terms of people being able to have guns for self-defense, I worry, at some point. Uh, Neil Gorsuch's appointment to the Supreme Court is extremely important. I'm not sure whether this case is going to go. As you were pointing out before our discussion, there's not really a split on the circuits on this. But, you know, it's just so far off base, you kind of hope that uh, the Supreme Court will break its rule and decide this is important up to here. I'm sure they'll appeal it to the Supreme Court. But right now you have a 4-4 split on the Supreme Court. Uh, look, there are lots of important decisions, but up until this point, the Supreme Court's really just ruled on whether government can ban guns, yeah. whether it can ban all guns or an entire category of guns. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if Hillary had won, then they would have had a 5-4 to four majority to go and say the government can completely ban guns. And so uh, Neil Gorsuch, I think it's pretty confident to say he doesn't fall into that camp. And so, you know, it's can't get much more basic. The Supreme, if the Second Amendment means anything, yeah. it's whether or not the government can completely ban guns or not. Well, we're talking to John Lott. He's the author of the book, The War on Guns. John, tell us a little bit about the book while you wrote it. Well. There's a lot of misinformation out there right now. Uh, you know, Bloomberg spent $28 million on just two initiatives in Nevada and Maine last year to try to have these background checks on private transfers. 
he effectively lost both of those races there, you know, which kind of goes against this claim that 90% of people support these types of initiatives yeah. that are there. But, you know, my concern is that a lot of these gun control laws disarm the most vulnerable people in our society. My research, if it convinces me of anything, is that poor minorities who live in high crime urban areas, the people who are most likely to be victims of violent crime, are the people who benefit the most from having the benefit of a gun to protect themselves. And so you go and have these background check fees. So in Washington, D.C., it costs $175 to privately transfer a gun. That may not stop you or I from being able to get a gun, mm -hmm. but a poor sure. person who lives in that area, that's that right. may make, that's a real tax. In California, uh, they just passed an initiative in November, uh, Proposition 63, that requires a background check on buying ammunition, and um, you can only buy 100 rounds. Well, you, you and I can go to a store and buy 100 rounds of 22s for $12, but then the background checks in California cost $70. Yeah. So that's like a 600% tax sure. that they're putting on top of that to be able to go and get those 100 rounds that you have there. Yeah. And so uh, I think what Democrats have, gun control advocates have done is they say, well, we haven't been able to completely ban it. And so what we want to do is tax it and make it as costly as possible. And the problem is, is one of the reasons why I wrote the book is just so people kind of understand some of the problems with the current gun control laws. So everybody wants to stop criminals from getting a hold of guns. But the current background check system is a complete mess. Mm. So when people say, well, 2.4 million dangerous prohibited people have been stopped from buying guns, that's false. What they should say is there have been 2.4 million initial denials and that virtually all of those were mistakes. Yeah. Well, John, one of the things that you deal with is, is research and facts. And I know that we're having a debate in this country right now with the president calling a lot of media organizations fake news and challenging them directly about the facts that they're reporting. Uh, you have Facebook, which is now relying on a lot of liberal fact-checking organizations. Uh, what does this mean in terms of uh, the Second Amendment and guns? Because as we've seen, I think the liberal media certainly has a out against the Second Amendment and, and sometimes is rather careless with the facts when it comes to reporting on these issues. Yeah, look, unfortunately the fact check organizations have the same biases as the rest of the media yes. has on these things. And so it's, you know, to go and say what news articles are going to be given attention on Facebook is going to depend upon these fact checkers is pretty scary stuff. Um, you know, I just had a fact check by PolitiFact this last week about uh, gun-free zones. And, uh, you know, they were saying, well, you know, there's Bloomberg's group claims that most shootings don't occur in gun-free zones, and I was arguing the opposite. And, you know, it's like they'll argue with you about whether military bases are gun-free zones. I don't know if yeah. any of these guys have been to a military base. I, I've had a son who was stationed at Fort Hood. It's like a city, you know, sure they have guards at the outside gates to come in, but yeah. inside it, you have military police drive around in cars just like in Washington, D.C. Right. Yeah. And the notion that, but the, but the soldiers, my son, when he was stationed in Afghanistan, he was required to have his military weapon with him at all times. He goes to the restroom, he has to have it. He goes eat, he has to have okay. it. But when he was at Fort Hood, he wasn't allowed to have it. He was like a block and a half away from the second Fort Hood shooting when it occurred. Yeah. But there's nothing he could do, nor any of the other soldiers at the time. They had to wait for the MPs to show up, and they weren't nearby when it occurred. And so, you know, uh, I could go through other cases that are there, but it's just like th things that kind of defy logic in terms of what Bloomberg will classify as a gun-free zone or not. If you look at the cases from 1950 on, over 98% of the mass public shootings in the United States have taken place where general citizens aren't allowed to carry oh. guns. So they'll get into arguments and say, well, police are allowed to carry guns in a place. But that misses the point. Yes. Yeah. You know, I have to say, police have an extremely difficult job in stopping these types of terrorist attacks. You put a man in uniform, it's kind of like putting a neon sign above them saying, shoot me first. And they're usually the ones who are shot first. We yeah. should be thankful for the job that they're willing to do. 
but there's a benefit from having citizens with concealed carry. They also make it safer for the police because when a terrorist reveals his position to go and attack a uniformed police officer, if they're concealed carry, he knows yeah. he has to worry about one of those people knowing that he's there, there, and possibly taking him out. So it, it makes the job of police safer too. Yeah, yeah. Well, John, it, 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 this is you know, I'm just so um, always so impressed with you coming armed with the facts and, and making sure that uh, your audience and others know about them. One other issue that I want to I want to touch on before we wrap is voter fraud. Obviously, big in the news. The president has said he he wants to have an investigation. He's put the vice president Pence in charge of that. What are what are what's the biggest misconception out there reported in the media about voter fraud? Because I mean, on your website, you've documented plenty of cases where it, where it's taken place. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've found dozens of cases just within the month before the November election that we had. You know, you have places where, uh, you know, 200 voting ballots were sent to the same address for a one-bedroom apartment and things yeah. like that that occur. Uh, you know, you have California's given uh, driver's licenses to 820,000 illegal aliens. You have states around the country like California which go and give discounts on college tuition to people who are illegal aliens. Yeah. And, uh, you know... I just find it hard to believe that they don't think with the motor voter and other things that are there that, you know, even if 10% of these people were registered to vote, it, you know, you're talking about many hundreds of thousands or a million or so people, even if it's that small of a percent. Sure. Considering the margins in, right. in just this last year's election. Right. Yeah. It makes a big difference. Well, John Lott, again, author of The War on Guns. It's great to have you on the program oh, well, again. Thank you very much. We'll see you again soon. We'll be back with more interviews today at CPAC 2017 for The Daily Signal. I'm Rob Bluey, signing off. Thanks, everyone.